The ramifications of that, in my opinion, is a far stronger, more vital, more alive, more beautiful culture, and therefore a better civilization. Bitcoin doesn't just magically fucking fix you. Like it's not it's not like some magic pill that you pop and all of a sudden you become virtuous and you know a great person. No, no, no. These virtues need to be consciously worked on. We need to define or decide what those virtues are now before we get mega rich. Because it's too late then. If you're an idiot and then all of a sudden you end up with a lot of money, you just have more money to be an idiot with. The current paradigm cannot last and it is self-defeating. The fiat system is basically the master of scoring own goals. Bitcoin is a new paradigm which ticks all the boxes that obviously gold had, it ticks all the boxes that fiat had, and it ticks some new boxes that neither of them had. The computer that I'm talking to you on, the headphones, the seat that I'm sitting on, the house that I'm in at the moment, the car that I drove on the way here, like all of this stuff needs to be measured in Bitcoin. That's not going to happen overnight. That's not going to happen in our generation. We're going to move on to a new socioeconomic paradigm and we need a new playbook. The current playbook on the current socioeconomic paradigm in the fiat land is lie, cheat, steal, get into politics, bureaucrat, HR departments, steal, 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 parasite, parasite, parasite. That's the playbook for winning today. On a new socioeconomic standard, we'll need a new playbook. And I believe that playbook has to do with these key virtues, honesty, integrity, courage, justice, self-control, respect, honor, compassion. Um, why do you think Bitcoin will win and what, what do you think is like the, the implications of, of Bitcoin winning for, for us? I think Bitcoin is going to win just by pure, how can I say, strength. So you've, you've, got, you've got a weakening existing paradigm. So the, the current paradigm of the world is fiat. It's structured around cheating. It's structured around average around weakness around lying around all of these like virtues which i would argue are anti-life particularly with like central banking like you are fundamentally weakening the monetary base by the existence of central banking you're printing money you're making everyone poorer you're you're just you're basically unraveling and destroying the capital base so the the current paradigm cannot last and it is self-defeating bitcoin is a new paradigm which ticks all the boxes that obviously gold had, it ticks all the boxes that fiat had, and it ticks some new boxes that neither of them had. So it's like strong across the board. And by virtue of the fact that people have the you know, motivation for self-preservation, in time, they're going to move across to Bitcoin. Now, I'm not one of these people that thinks it's going to happen this decade. In my opinion, it'll take a couple of generations. But that is, is not, I, I don't say that as a way to disparage Bitcoin, but more to imply that Bitcoin is bigger than what we all think. Like for something so fundamental to shift, like the, for, for the entire socioeconomic paradigm to shift and for everything on the planet to be measured in Bitcoin. That's like mind-bogglingly big. Like people, I don't, I don't think people appreciate that. The, the the computer that I'm talking to you on, the headphones, the seat this, that I'm sitting on, the house that I'm in at the moment, the car that I drove on the way here, like all of this stuff needs to be measured in Bitcoin. That's not going to happen overnight. That's not going to happen in our generation. It's going to happen in the subsequent and the subsequent and the subsequent generations. So the magnitude of this change is extraordinarily large. Because of that, so, so you've got kind of two factors here. You've got Bitcoin is rising and it'll become more important. It'll become more strong and it'll happen over generations. And at the same time, we have the time for the existing uh, status quo to weaken, to keep fucking itself over. Sorry if I'm not allowed to swear. But basically the, the fiat system is basically the, the master of scoring own goals, right? That's the, that's the situation we're playing here. So ultimately... Bitcoin wins. And the second question, what implications does it have? I was at a conference in Prague recently and I gave a talk called Beauty Will Save the World. And in there, I said that, look, sure, Bitcoin will help bank the unbanked and it's a great store of value and all this sort of stuff like that. That's all important. But I think what's most important to me, at least, is that Bitcoin establishes a framework for excellence. And what I mean by that is by making it more difficult to, more difficult for institutionalized stealing 
and cheating and lying and politicking, by making the institutionalization of that more difficult, you create a framework where other virtues such as excellence, such as courage, such, such as honor, respect, integrity, all of these sorts of things become more valued and more prized because that becomes the way to win. The ramifications of that, in my opinion, is a far stronger, more vital, more alive, more beautiful culture and therefore a better civilization. So I think that's the bigger impact and more important that bit, uh, impact that Bitcoin will have. But all of that is obviously downstream of fixing the money and also human beings fixing themselves. We can't just expect Bitcoin to magically fix us. So yeah, that's a long answer to your question. That's an, uh, that's an interesting take. And my mind was going there where you, you probably, like, everybody knows that like hard times creates strong, uh, men and uh, like down the road, this, this, I think everyone is familiar with that saying. Um, is, is it possible that with Bitcoin now that we don't go off the, the good times that we create this like abundance and, and everyone has to actually put in the proof of work and has the right mindset and ethos. And that's why we, we don't go off this, these up and down streams. Unfortunately, I don't think so. Uh, I think we're always going to have strong men, uh, creating good times, good times, creating weak men, weak creating hard times. I think the, and I grappled with this for almost 50 pages in the book, uh, maybe not that long, maybe 20, 30 pages in the book, but I, I grapple with this concept. I'm like, okay, can we get away from seasons and cycles? Uh, is, is it like a, because it's almost like a, you know, what, what do the central planners try and do? They're like, oh, look, there's a business cycle. So let's avoid the business cycle by printing money and propping things up when things get bad, right? So it's almost like a central banker's Uh, frame of mind to say that, oh yeah, with Bitcoin, we're going to avoid the cycles. Well, no, we're not. Unfortunately, as material wealth increases, so too does entitlement, so too does liberalism, so too does more leftist thinking. So all of this sort of stuff comes as a result of increased material wealth. And at some point, you get to that stage of the weak men uh, period And they do start to dismantle civilization, make things hard again, and then the uh, hard men rise again. So in my opinion, we don't get away from it. At the very least, what we do is this. We build a structure that is more able to withstand the weak men period of time. And what I mean by that is this. I'll, I'll explain it by way of an analogy. So imagine you have the seasons, summer, fall, Uh, winter, spring, and wh whatever the order is. If you know that, uh, so let, let me explain it this way. You, you've got a house that needs to be built to withstand the seasons, right? So you build it out of wood and you build a bunch of wood and it, it helps us stay alive through the winter, right? Because before every other winter, everyone was dying. So you build it out of uh, wood and all of a sudden you getting through a number of winters and people get become more complacent. They become more entitled. And at some point, you end up getting this sort of uh, this period of entitled brats, weak men who are like, you know what, I'm not going to go outside and I'm not going to cut any trees anymore. I'm not going to cut any more firewood. We have enough. Fuck it. Let's just keep warming ourselves up because I'm too fat, lazy, whatever the case is, too entitled to go and do that. So they run out of firewood and the winter comes again and they're cold and they're like, fuck, what do I do now? So then they start taking the chairs that are in the house, they start taking the table, they start ripping down the doors, and they're using all of this as firewood because they're too uh, concerned about going outside and doing the actual work. So they start eroding the capital. And at some point, the future generation that comes in after them all of a sudden doesn't have a house left and they freeze to death, right? So that's kind of what's happening in the fiat stage at the moment is the, the fiat stage that we're in the weak men stage of the cycle that we're in, we are dismantling the capital that has been built over hundreds of years or thousands of years, really. And we're wondering why things are breaking. Whereas on a Bitcoin standard, I would say that the winter is still going to come. The entitled breaths are still going to come, but we'll have a structure or a house that is more made of steel and glass and stone and wood and all of this mixture of things. So it's more robust. So the idiots basically don't burn the house down before the next generation comes in. So with that being said, I think Bitcoin will help lower the amplitude of damage or the magnitude of damage done during the weak stage. 
That's very interesting. Um, it, it's like, I think you, uh, you have a trailer of the, on the, in, in the book, uh, uh, on, on the, how's the, the site called where you raise money for the book? On I forgot it. Yeah. 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 Wiser. And there's a trailer of the book and, and you raised a question that I never asked myself or ask anyone else. Um, I think you, it wasn't that trailer. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but will the new generation of like OG Bitcoiners, um, kind of be the next elite and be the next, like, uh, people who exploit the, <laughs> the people that are late to Bitcoin or the no corners. Uh, because like when, when Bitcoin goes where we think it goes, um, and we have Bitcoiners now that bought Bitcoin under 100 euros, under a thousand euros, even under 100,000 euros. Um, and Bitcoin at some point is just so high that like fear don't even exist. They probably have a lot of, power and a lot of influence do you think the the og wealthy bitcoiners could could uh, exploit the the new generation of of uh yeah the, the new working class absolutely so i think there's two things to point out here number one is that there's nothing wrong with power and influence uh it's it's actually a gift and it's a responsibility the challenge comes when weak people attain both power and influence so when strong people attain it they use the power and influence as a means to an end, whereas weak people generally use power and influence as the end, right? And you see that with communists, for example. They're ugly, weak, disgusting people, and they use power to bring everybody down to their level, whereas strong people use power and influence to raise civilization up, to make it more vital, to make it more ascendant. It's a, it's a very different end. So, so that being said, though, and this is the important, this is exactly why I wrote the book, is... It's not so clear to me that those who have Bitcoin today and who will become uh, disproportionately economically powerful and influential will also become virtuous. It's, it's not very clear to me because if we look at the, the history of Bitcoin, people who got into Bitcoin at like a dollar or two dollars or five dollars or ten dollars, the ones that held on to it generally become shitcoiners. They become degenerates. They become Lambo retards. They either get into some sort of politics or whatever. Like so, so so far we don't actually have a great track record. There's a there's a small group of people who have been or who have chosen to be more virtuous. Like there is a there is a you know I guess you could call like the Saifedeens of the world and the GGs of the world and you know there's people like that that have held on and they've used Bitcoin as a as a mechanism for channeling virtue and good behavior and nobility and all of these of these powerful virtues but you know you look at the, the Brian Armstrongs the Vitalik Buterins the the Brock Pierces and the Roger Veers and like all of these people who are generally really early to Bitcoin what did they do they became degenerates they became a parasitic class they became political they tried to change Bitcoin they did all this weird fucking shit so my argument of the book is that look Bitcoin doesn't just magically fucking fix you. Like it's not, it's not like some magic pill that you pop and all of a sudden you become virtuous and, you know, a great person. No, no, no. These virtues need to be consciously worked on and we need to define or decide what those virtues are now before we get mega rich, right? Because it's too late then. Like if, if you, if you all of a sudden, if you're an idiot and then all of a sudden you end up with a lot of money, you just have more money to be an idiot with. Right. That's why people who win the lottery are, are generally like morons. Like they get lucky, they win the lotto, they burn through all their money, they do a bunch of damage and then like they're back to square one. Right. So my fear is that many Bitcoiners end up with that. And some of them might just end up like not intentionally being bad people, but they haven't worked on themselves. They haven't built character. They haven't established a set of virtues or principles to live by. And then all of a sudden their life is a mess. They get a bunch more money and they have more to be a mess with. And that's really dangerous. So this is why, in my opinion, the greatest cultures throughout history, those that preceded the greatest civilizations, spent a lot of time developing virtues, particularly in the warrior class, because the warrior class is the class in civilization that inspires those below them and is a uh, beacon for those above them because those above them uh, depend on them, right? So the warrior class generally is the one where the virtues were most inculcated. And those virtues were generally things like courage, like compassion, like justice, like responsibility, 
like respect and duty and loyalty and self-control and all of these things, right? So in my opinion, we must seek to start developing that now so that as Bitcoin starts to succeed, we kind of like catch up with Bitcoin and are people worthy of the power and the influence that we're going to be able to wield when Bitcoin is $500,000, a million, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million. That, that has to start now. You don't just become virtuous overnight. So, so that's the premise of the book. I lay out what are the virtues, what matters, who must we become before we get ultra rich and wealthy, and how can we then inculcate those values in, into our offspring. What, what, what is the warrior class? Uh, what, what is, uh, where is this coming from? So specifically when I was writing the book, I looked at, okay, what were the greatest civilizations on earth? The modern West, uh, medieval Japan, the Romans, the Greeks, they're, they're sort of the four that I really um, focused in on medieval Europe as well. And I looked at, okay, what preceded these civilizations? And what preceded these civilizations was a particular kind of culture, right? A culture that was generally excellence oriented. It was quite hierarchical. Um, there was a particular way of being. Um, there was particular virtues that were embodied by this um, by this culture. And then I looked at what the virtues are. And the way you can think about what the word virtue means, it means almost like a blend of principles and behavior. So virtues is like how, how you behave, who you are, right? It's different to a value. A value is more something that is like you want to experience. A virtue is how you behave, right? And values are generally downstream of virtues. Like if you value freedom, you must behave responsibly and have autonomy in order to feel freedom, right? If you renounce your responsibility, that means you don't value freedom, right? Because by giving up your responsibility, you're no longer free. You are dependent on somebody else. You are dependent if you're not responsive. So anyway, that being said, these virtues that I looked into them, in all of these great cultures, the virtues were established by the warrior class. So in Japan, it was the samurai. In uh, the West, it was the knights. In Rome, it was the legionnaires. In Greece, it was the hoplites or the phalanx, right? It was, it was always the warrior classes because the, the lower classes, those below the warriors, they looked up to the warriors because the warriors defended them. Nobody else, the, the, the farmers, the artisans, the merchants, the peasants, nobody really had a territorial life without the warriors defending them. And the nobility, the aristocracy, the royalty, the kings didn't have a territory and didn't have rule without the warrior class. So the warrior class sort of stood out as a beacon of, uh, as a beacon of behavior or a beacon of character. And it was their virtues that were embedded within these cultures, which preceded the greatest civilization. So that's where I drew the virtues from. And what I found was that across all of these cultures, the virtues just overlapped. You know, you, you have like particularly the, the Japanese during the feudal age with the samurai. You compare that with the West and the knight during the feudal age. It's almost the same thing. And these people had no interaction with each other. They, they, like it happened at the same time with the same class of people, with the same virtues, with zero relationship between each other. And I found that super fascinating. I was like, okay, that means there must be truth here. And, and that was the, the premise of why I chose those virtues and how the warrior class inspired it. So the book, as I understand it now, um, has the goal uh, to prepare Bitcoiners f what to come for Bitcoin and for the new world. Pretty much. I, the argument is that we're going to move on to a new socioeconomic paradigm and we need a new playbook. The current playbook on the current socioeconomic paradigm in the fiat land is lie, cheat, steal, get into politics, bureaucrat, HR departments, steal, 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 parasite, parasite, parasite. That's the playbook for winning today. On a new socioeconomic standard, we'll need a new playbook. And I believe that playbook has to do with these key virtues, honesty, integrity, courage, justice, self-control, respect, honor, compassion, all of that sort of stuff. 
you mentioned before uh, communists um, and for me it's really interesting when we look at money and when we look at uh, Bitcoin now uh, I feel like we have for the first time ever the, a, a real chance of actually um, eliminating the connection between a government uh, governments and money it's always kind of the the connection between there uh, do we therefore also eliminate um, communism and socialism uh, because money is free and, and we have a, a free market um, basis and, and nobody can actually control it? Man, I hope so. <laughs> one of the one of the linchpins for communism is obviously get control of the money and then socialize the wealth. Um, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because... Yeah, like I, I don't see how socialism can function at scale without having access to the monetary spigot. I mean, this is a – now, like you could argue that somebody could come into a territory and claim power and amass power and be, you know, someone that uses guilt to make a entire class of people basically, um, I don't know, vote for the beheading like this is sort of what happened in france right in the in the uh in the french revolution what idiots think it was a good thing but it was a really really bad thing for western civilization is they even even though like france wasn't really printing money it was you know on a gold standard it wasn't on a fiat standard um they managed to round up a bunch of people They killed off a bunch of the nobility. They killed off a bunch of the monarchies, uh, monarchists. They killed off a bunch of the royals. And they plunged the country into a leftist dystopia. So it can potentially still happen. Uh, I just think that it'll be much harder in the future with the existence of, uh, of Bitcoin. So I don't know. I, I hope. I'm cautiously optimistic. What is your favorite um, virtue? Like you, you talked about the warrior mindset uh, and, and you kind of collected from all those different, uh, from the knights, from the samurais and all, all the things. Um, what is your favorite, like the, the one thing uh, that Bitcoiners definitely have to uh, adopt or uh, have to have in order to like uh, exceed in, in the new world? Yeah, it's hard. Um... I've always held very close to my heart the the virtue of courage. Uh, I, I don't think anything works without courage. In in the book, I call it uh, faith in action or something like that. It, you know, courage is the ability to do something even though you can't see it, even though you're afraid, even though it's like inconceivable. It is the capacity to do it despite that fact. And to me, that's that's quite powerful. Now, arguably, to be a Bitcoiner requires quite a bit of courage already. So people probably have that ingredient, uh, being Bitcoiners um, already. So beyond that, um, I think the the one. So I let let me preframe this by saying that I think courage is just fundamental. But I think a lot of Bitcoiners already have a predisposition for courage, which means. The one that we are most missing, or that Bitcoin is in general are most missing that they need, I believe is excellence. Excellence is the opposite to average. And I think this is a big, a big hole in a lot of Bitcoiners philosophy. Everyone runs around and says, you know, I'm a pleb and we are all Satoshi and there's, you know, the strength in numbers, virus and numerus and, you know, all this sort of stuff, which to me honestly sounds very communist. I, I get that it's not communist. I get that when, you know, we say we're all Satoshi, we're talking about the anonymity set. Um, I get that when people talk about plebs, what they're saying is trying to create a separation between fake elites and people who are hardworking and want to build something. But in the book, and I speak about this quite a bit, it's that, look, the, the plebeians or, or the average man is the, is the cancer that the globalists and the ugly people have infected our brains with to make us think that average is somehow something to be admired and excellence is something to be scorned against but it's the opposite excellence is the only pathway to beauty you you, you cannot like the, the word excellent and i go through this in the book like every single virtue i spend the first two pages looking at the japanese etymology the english etymology the latin etymology and i look at what the basis of these words are like what the fuck do they actually mean and with excellence you have the word is made up of two uh, components egg and salaire which is 
to do with the separation of the mountain from the flatland, right? So excellence is about climbing a mountain, about separating oneself. Excellence is, by definition, for the few. Excellence is not an average thing. Like, literally, excellence and average are polar opposites. They, they, they're not, they don't exist in the same frame of reference. Um, excellence is hierarchical. Excellence is exclusionary. Excellence is not comfortable. Excellence is what is required for growth. Excellence requires separation. Excellence is elite. Excellence is aristocratic. Excellence is noble. Excellence is all of these things, which is very different to pleb and average and we're all Satoshi and all that sort of stuff. So I think this is a big weakness in just general, uh, the general Bitcoin consciousness, which I'm personally challenging, which is I challenge people who are going to be the socioeconomic elite to stop calling themselves average, stop finding nobility in average and start, start like accepting the fact that you're going to be socioeconomically more significant than most people. If you're a Bitcoiner now, um, also start looking at what are the, the virtues that you need to embody and particularly excellence, like start becoming comfortable with not only pushing yourself to uh, excellence, so like demanding the best of yourself in the physical sense, in the intellectual sense, the psychological sense, the emotional sense, the, the spiritual sense, like all of these things, like push yourself, but also both admire and support others who do that themselves. So I see this a lot in, you know, I grew up in Australia and we've got this thing called the tall poppy syndrome. You see someone succeed a little bit and you try and cut them down. Right. And that comes from envy. That comes from resentment. That comes from this sort of like crabs in a bucket mentality. It's like, Oh, you know, if somebody starts getting ahead, we better bring them back down because we're all average and we're all in this together. No, no, no. Fuck that. That's a, that's a really bad, uh, frame of mind. If you see someone succeeding, get behind them, support them and use that to inspire you to succeed. And that's how we all climb. Like the more of us climbing the mountain, the more ascendant civilization becomes. The more of us bringing everybody down to the flatland, the more average we become. And average is the first step to death. Like average is the opposite direction to excellence. So if I had to sum up your question, I know it's a long answer to it, but courage is fundamentally important. And in fact, courage is the driver for excellence, but excellence is the big, the big hole in Bitcoin mindset, at least from what I can tell. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simple simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. I, I, I love that a lot and I see that myself with there are concepts in, in, in Bitcoin there's like this proof of work mindset there's like this low time preference mindset and I sometimes see that Bitcoiners are using low time preference as an excuse to be lazy totally, totally. <laughs> I, I, I I've seen that, like, uh, so, so many times, like, oh, no, no, I, I, I do it only like once a month or do, do this, like, uh, not a, too many, I, even with my podcast, uh, that's why I do it every day. Uh, people, uh, don't grasp why, why I do a daily podcast with every single day, a different podcast guest. Like there's, wow. like, there's a lot of interviews to do uh, this week. I have 11. Um, the, if I want to be average, I do like two, maybe mm -hmm. three most mm -hmm. to that. And I want to be better than that. I know that there are already, already so many great podcasters, um, like Peter McCormick, there's Natalie Brunel. There are so many bigger ones, way bigger ones that started way earlier than me. The only chance for me even having a chance of, of being on the same level with them, I have to massively out to compete them in, in the quantity and then the quality will catch up. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's, uh, 
I, I see it sometimes like, oh no, lower your time preference, do it two times a week, uh, get the quality right. <laughs> like it's like, no, no, I want to do it every day and I want to still have my quality right. So I, I, I like a lot what you're saying in, in the book and with excellence and, uh, detaching yourself from, from average and trying to excel in, in, in every single way. And I'm really curious about the book. I, I really have to, to pick it up. And I'm, I'm really, <laughs> you, you got me now uh, interested. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's become a plague in modern civilization and it happens inside Bitcoin and outside Bitcoin is people have started to, uh, replace reverence or uh, admiration for envy and resentment right and envy and resentment are the ugliest ugliest possible um uh attributes or vices or emotions right like envy is, and, and resent like nietzsche spoke about this 150 years ago right is he he described how the way modern civilization was going and the introduction of these sort of equalitarian and democratic principles will lead to a time when the masses become fundamentally envious and resentful of anything beautiful, anything great, anything high, anything noble. And it's happening. You look at all these psychopathic eco-terrorists, you know, they see a beautiful statue. So what do they think? They think they should knock it over or they should stick their hand to it or they should throw paint on the fucking painting or something like that. It's like, it's absolutely mind boggling, right? The kind of stupidity that is happening today, but it stems from that place of lack of ugliness, of resentment and from envy. Like it's these, and, it, and it's always the people who you see like their own lives are broken. They have no meaning in life so that they go and try and tear other things down. And it's absolutely disgusting. I fucking hate it. And I see lighter elements of that inside Bitcoin and inside every other industry and we need to we need to stamp that shit out it's it's absolute evil yeah i see it a lot uh, i don't know i always hear that it's in america better uh but in austria and in europe we have kind of this mindset um when we see someone succeed we're envy of them mm-hmm. we we are like oh he has to do some dirty business he has to do some yeah. bad things yeah, he's, yeah, ca- yeah. he's part of like some bad groups and not like like oh how he did, how did he do it uh, let's let's sit down with him and let's ask him hey what did you do how how can i uh, benefit from it what can i learn from you like the 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 curiosity just seeing someone like when i see someone uh, succeed and i see someone in my friends group or i see someone at a bitcoin conference or whatever and, and he made a really successful whatever uh, i generally ask and this is kind of also how the, <laughs> the podcast came to be uh, how, I generally ask, like, how did you get there? What, what, what was your learnings and what, how, what can I take away from that? Like, um, you have a massive advantage and the one feels flatter. Like you, you win and, and boy, it's, it's such a great thing, uh, to do. And it's such an easy thing to do, but like, uh, there's some envy, some resentments in, in us that, that kind of holds us back. I feel like. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's something, that's a demon we must all contend with. And that's why to, for, for your question, I specifically picked, uh, excellence as the, as the thing we need to work on. Amazing. Uh, work on, uh, is a great, um, a great, uh, guide to, to our next question. Um, you said in the beginning that you also want to, uh, talk about Salantis, uh, and Nostra. I never heard about Salantis. I've, I've literally no clue <laughs> what this is. I heard about Nostra. Of course I'm on Nostra also. Um, but what are you doing there? So last year I spent, I'll give some context and background so it makes more sense, but last year I spent the year going down the AI rabbit hole. Um, and unlike Bitcoin, you know, when you go down the rabbit hole, you discover more and more interesting stuff. You get more bullish, you get more interested, you go down more rabbit holes, etc. When I went down the AI rabbit hole, it was the opposite. The more and more I went down, the more stupid I discovered it was. I was like, okay, this is a scam, this is bullshit. This is just a probability machine. It's all hocus pocus. It's like Wizard of Oz. So after a good, I mean, I'd say nine months, like intense down the rabbit hole, but like a good 12 months, I was messing around with this stuff. I realized that there's no business there. It's a big bubble. Uh, it's all going to pop and it's going to, you know, the shit show is going to end. So along the way, somebody approached me and said, Hey, do you think we could build a travel concierge? Uh, that's like an AI. That's like a chatbot. 
so like ChatGPT for travel that knows all the Bitcoin locations. I was like, okay, interesting idea. We workshopped that. We realized yeah, that's not the right, uh, it's not the right, uh, what's the word, like experience. It's not the right interface. Uh, a better interface is more like a, like a trip advisor or a nomad list or something like that where you can get a visual sense of what's going on. So we started building like a, a Bitcoin travel directory. We were going to call it Destination Bitcoin. And the more we dug into it, the more we realized that, hey, we want to have ambassadors locally. How are we going to validate the ambassadors? Well, maybe we can use the Nostra account. Oh, well, what else can Nostra offer? Oh, shit, maybe we can integrate the uh, the Nostra social graph to make the locations more relevant. So when you go to a different location, if you're interested in food and I'm interested in Bitcoin, we should see different things in the location. We should see different meetups, different events, different merchants, different uh, content on the feed, etc. So the idea basically evolved into, I, I don't even know what to call it, where, where sort of the, the working title is a travel nomad and community social network. So People can look at it at satlantis.io. The current iteration of the product is way more like a web directory. And you can basically go and see different cities. You can get a sense for the cities, like how, like, are they walkable? Are they safe? What's the cost of living like? All this sort of scoring. You can go into the city. You can see what people are associated with the city. So I know one big problem for Bitcoiners, which Orange Pill app to some degree tried to solve, but it just, it's, it's a bit weird, like just being randomly contacted by people. Whereas on Nostra, like you can build a following and you can contact someone you can see if it's someone you know, if you've got mutual friends or whatever. But basically on, on this, you can go to the city and you can see who's in the city, like who's a resident, who's an ambassador, who's following the city. You can then connect with people. You can see what else is going on. You can join events. You can find merchants. You can do all this sort of stuff. And it's, um, it's taken on a life of its own. Here we are like six months into it. We're building effectively a super app, but yeah, the, the basic vision is that it's it's somewhere that people can go to discover who's there, what to do, uh, what events to go to, what's interesting about the city, etc. All influenced by your social graph. And that's where the Nostra piece comes in. And what, in my opinion, is really interesting about Nostra is it's a portable social graph. If you could carry your social graph around and embedded into different applications, different applications should be informed by that social graph. In other words, different applications can be made dynamic based on your Nostra social graph. And to me, that's the Nostra superpower that not enough people are talking about. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, Nostra had last year, so like uh, almost everybody talked about it. Uh, it. It kind of flattened now, it, mm -hmm. at least I see it now uh, less and less uh, talked about. Um, and I always ask every guest before I end the podcast or where can people find you? Where can people ask you questions? And I think, yeah, I don't know, every, every 20th guest or every 30th guest or something like that is saying, Oh, I'm also Nostra. Most say Twitter. Uh, like I think probably 95% of, of guests say Twitter, uh, where they ask you questions. Uh, some also have YouTube, some other, uh, have other socials. Um, is, is, is Nostra. Um, the future, st still the future of social media and, and this social graph and social layer of our society, uh, or is this, this, uh, network effect of these big social media companies just too hard to crack? No, I mean, the, look, the, the network effect of the big social media companies is going to be difficult to crack and it's going to take time. For me, the way to think about Nostra is it's not the future of social networks. It's the future of the internet where all internet applications are influenced by your social graph. So all internet applications, wh whether it's like an, a, a bookstore like Amazon, where the, like imagine going to a book and when you read the reviews, the reviews that you see on the top come from the people that you follow or the people who you follow follow. So that way there's like a relevance to the thing. Imagine, so one of the features on Atlantis is you go to a merchant and on the merchant page, not only can the merchant have a profile so they can build an audience like they can on Instagram, but they have their information like they have on Google and they have their reviews. And let's say I come to, I don't know which part of uh, Austria or Germany you're in, but let's say I go to Munich and you live in Munich and I go to a restaurant 
you've reviewed this restaurant, I'll see your review at the top. Which means to me now, because I follow you, there's a higher chance that you and I like similar things. So number one, I know it's real. Number two, it's more relevant to me. So you, you can start to think that the social graph basically acting as a layer of the internet will change the way all applications on top operate. So it's very early days. Like I would say we're in the 1989 or 1990 of Nostra, right? So the internet was still young at that point. It was still early days. In the next decade, Nostra is going to change the foundation upon which, uh, under, underneath which, sorry, the, uh, the rest of the applications are built. So I think it's definitely the future. Like I, I got a little bit bearish as well because I went down the AI rabbit hole and I was like less interested in the Nostra stuff. Like over 2023, I was like, yeah, whatever, no worries. But as we started going down this rabbit hole of how can we build a dynamic travel application, a dynamic community application, man, Nostra is head and shoulders above all the other, um, uh, all the other toolkits that will enable something like this to be built. So yeah, man, I, lo I look forward to, to seeing how this is going to grow, but I'm ultra, ultra bullish. And in fact, I, I believe we get mass Nostra adoption long before we get mass Bitcoin adoption. It's like, um, the, the thing that comes now in my head is, uh, when I go and search for like new guests or I see some replies and I want to figure out if, if I want to have him on my podcast, um, I just click on this profile and the biggest signal I get is, how many people that I follow, follow this person. Totally. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what you described. What if we can have this social graph that we have only in the Twitter ecosystem all over the uh, internet and we can see everywhere this social graph and, and Nostra is kind of not the social network. It's like the, the social graph that we can take around the Correct. internet and it is also connecting with Twitter is also connecting with other applications. Uh, that would be extremely cool. Like yeah. I, I would love that uh, yeah. because now when someone sends me, Oh, uh, you should have this him on the podcast. I'm like, what's his Twitter handle? Like this is my biggest signal because there I just have the biggest network and I know the most people. And this is like kind of my thing where I grew up uh, with. Uh, if he is only uh, uh, on LinkedIn, I, I have no clue about like I have to really search the articles, everything, what he's doing, what he's writing. Um, or when he's not on social media, like it's, it's, it's even, uh, even harder then. But uh, this kind of signal around the world, that, uh, around the internet, that would be uh, amazing to have. Like that's an, an, a really cool idea and a really cool uh, thing to do. And you're saying this is uh, faster than, than Bitcoin adoption. So you imagine that being reality in like five, 10 years? Yeah, for sure. I think it's way faster. I think this idea of a portable social graph, there's like really explicit utility uh, on that. Bitcoin's fighting a bigger war. You know, that's the thing. Bitcoin's fighting the central banks, the entire statist structure. It's fighting the, the hedge funds, Wall Street. It's fighting governments. It, like Bitcoin has a massive war and it's got a basically the, the opportunity cost of going on the wrong social network is much lower for a person than the opportunity cost of getting the wrong money, right? Like you get the wrong money and you lose everything, you're fucked, right? If you got on the wrong social network and you lost your followers, ah, well, you know, it's a pain in the ass, but you go to the next social network. It's not the end of the world. So Bitcoin has like, it's, it's much more, uh, the stakes are way higher with Bitcoin and it's going to take a lot more change. And that's why I believe Bitcoin is going to take multiple generations to occur. Whereas Nostra is squarely in the, the technical realm and the technical realm is much more malleable than the socio-economic political realm like that takes that takes time to evolve and that's where bitcoin lives bitcoin lives kind of at the nexus of society technology economics and politics bitcoin lives in that space nostra lives squarely inside technology there's there's obviously a little bit of like politics philosophy all that sort of shit around it but fundamentally Nostra is a new tech stack and sure, Nostra might be fighting with Facebook and Twitter and all of that sort of stuff, but it is so fundamentally uh, better. And at some point, my prediction is that Elon will probably end up putting Twitter on Nostra anyway, uh, as Nostra becomes more of a uh, fundamental layer of the internet. And, you know, that, that might take five or 10 years, but it's going to happen. And also with, with uh, social networks, that's just 
no real opportunity cost. Like as you mentioned, um, I can just download another social media app and it costs me almost nothing. If I want to put like 10% out of Bitcoin into a new monetary system, this might, uh, might demolish this 10% that I put out of Bitcoin and lose, uh, and I lose opportunity costs. So like money is, is, is way harder to connect. It's a way harder totally. network effect, but it's also really wild. And when we talk about Bitcoin adoption, do you think, um, uh, that we kind of already have one or like, what are the battles that, that Bitcoin has still has to, to fight? And what are the battles that Bitcoin still needs to, to tackle, to, to get to this mass adoption? Or is it just time, uh, in, it's in time, now? man. Yeah, it's time. I mean, we're going to fight all sorts of stupid battles along the way. You know, now there's like this whole ordinals versus monetary maximalists. You know, you've got even infighting. Like I saw now that there's like, Bruce Fenton fighting with Jack Dorsey or something like that. Like, so, so this is like, fuck me. You know, the, Bitcoin is if there's one thing they're good at is like arguing and they just argue. Like if, if they get a little bit too bored with something and things are like, you know, something's not happening, they'll just yell at each other about whatever's the new thing these days. So, you know, I, I guess it keeps, keeps everyone sharp. Um, for me personally, I've kind of moved away from a lot of the infighting. I'm just sort of done with it. I've got too many things to build, too many things to write, too many things to say, too many things to do. But I think the, the battles are going to continue. There's going to be battles about custody. There's going to be battles to do with privacy. There's going to be battles to do like, you know, we've seen what's happened with CoinJoin and all that sort of stuff recently. There's going to be battles with, I'm sure at some point as the government gets more desperate and maybe not in the, this decade, maybe next decade, they try and do a 6102. There's going to be battles with like the Black Rocks of the world. So it's like, yeah, like sometimes I wonder, it's like, you know, the, the Bitcoin space is like a constant war. You know what I mean? Like it's just like a, you, you, you win one fight, you look up and you're like, yes. And you're like, oh fuck, there's something else coming. So it's, uh, yeah, the, the the battles will continue. That's all. I it's, a, it's a it's really interesting. Also, when you mentioned like it's there's there's also inside of of Bitcoin really fought, uh, fights about stuff, and then there is uh, fights for coming from the outside. And um, sometimes I feel like Bitcoin uh, is too much of a ideology, too much of a, a religion. Sometimes people um, put it too much in do, do you also feel like that that bitcoin is too much of a <laughs> too much of a religion sometimes i mean i i go back and forth on this topic i'm generally of the opinion that the religious element of bitcoin is quite important because these kind of movements have to be religious in nature like christianity won because there was this fervent rabid group of people who would literally give their lives for this idea of christianity they starved themselves they crucified themselves they martyred themselves all this sort of stuff and the romans were like fuck what what's going on with these people they're fucking insane uh we can't kill them we can't like not kill them like no matter what we do they are tied to this ideology and over time that like extreme commitment to an idea made christianity the the basically the the standard for europe right so I think Bitcoin in many ways is going to go through something similar. It's, it, it can't be just a technological movement. It can't be just an economic movement. Like those things are important. It's almost like in sales, they say that you need to, you need to have the emotional close first and then you do the logical close because people don't buy based on what they think. People buy based on what they feel, right? So when you're selling somebody, you make them want the thing by focusing on the benefits and then to avoid buyer's remorse, you reinforce the features, which is logical, and then people walk away happy with the purchase, right? If you don't do the logical piece, then people feel regret and they're like, oh, shit, I just did it because I was uh, con convinced into doing it. I was like, I was emotional. I was in the, in the wrong place. So with Bitcoin, it's actually got the emotional bit. That's the religion. And it's got the logical close because you can't fault Bitcoin. It's economically sound, it's philosophically sound, it's architecturally sound, it's technically sound and all that sort of stuff. But the, the, the religious idea of a new monetary standard that's going to fix the world and all this sort of stuff, as much as it's probably exaggerated, people uh, out of their fucking minds in many ways, like comparing it to Bitcoin is mycelium, Bitcoin is mushrooms, Bitcoin is fucking yoga and all this other weird shit that people compare it to. Um, 
I think that's exaggerated, but at the same time, I believe it's necessary because that what, that's what creates a movement. And that's what's necessary for us to stick through this across multiple generations because there's no way we win. Like we're not going to win in 10 years or 20 years. We're going to win in 100 years. And for something to last 100 years, it needs to be religious. Hmm. I love that a lot. Uh, that's, uh, that's a great explanation. Um, we have before our end routine always one question that is for every guest uh, the same question. Um, it's my aim to contribute to Bitcoin something other than Bitcoin. <laughs> Um, and the question for you is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Well, hopefully, people can learn something out of the Bushido of Bitcoin in terms of virtue, in terms of making themselves better, in terms of this concept of excellence, in terms of responsibility being the pathway to freedom. We can't be freedom maximalists. We actually have to be responsibility maximalists. Freedom is a outcome. Oh, sorry, freedom is downstream of responsibility. So I hope people can learn to be better, stronger, more vital, more ascendant human beings. And I hope that that's what the book, The Bushido of Bitcoin, delivers. And you know, maybe hopefully they can also learn something about Nostra. So I know that's two things, but I hope that's useful. Two things are better than one usually, sometimes. <laughs> Um, our end routine is, uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, and the question from the previous guest is, if you could sit down with anyone to chat about Bitcoin, who would it be and why? Is there a period of time or no? Uh, I would say right now, but uh, there's nothing specific. Uh, I, I would, it's, it's between like Steve Jobs, Nikola Tesla or Alexander the Great. Um, I feel like. Yeah, maybe, maybe the Alexander the Great context is a little bit off because he was obviously two and a half thousand years ago. Um, Steve Jobs was probably most uh, contextually applicable and obviously Nikola Tesla relevant still to some degree uh, and maybe he could have conceptualized it. Uh, but yeah, what, one, of, one of those three. So I, I don't have a definitive answer, but maybe all three. <laughs> There, there is, uh, I've not written, um, read too much about it, but I've written a thread, uh, where someone was claiming, oh, Steve's job has to be, uh, had to be Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> I don't know if you heard about that. Uh, it's I not didn't, impossible. I didn't, but that would be interesting. That would be very interesting. Yeah. So as, especially in that context, it would be extremely, uh, cool to sit down with Steve Jobs. <laughs> Perfect. Then, uh, thank you, Alexander, for, for being on. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people find, uh, the things that you produce? For sure. So let's start with Nostra. So if you just type in Svetsky, my surname, I should come up. Uh, I'm sure there's bots and scammers all over Nostra. So just look for the one that has like 13, 14,000 followers. Uh, on Twitter and Instagram, I'm under Svetsky Writes. So like writing W R I T E S. And on there, I, on Twitter, I'm a little bit more sporadic on Instagram. I've just reactivated my account and I'm trying to be a little bit more regular with posts. And I'm generally just posting about my, uh, about the book. And then for anyone who's interested based on the discussion we had about grabbing the book, it's on pre-sale now. You can get it at a discount at, uh, bushidoofbitcoin.com. So you can get some free chapters. And it's not like a single free chapter, like some tight ass. Like I, I give you a big chunk of the book in the free chapters uh, and you can pre-order it. There's two links there, one via Kickstarter and one via Geyser, which are both crowdfunding platforms, one Bitcoin denominated, the other fiat denominated. And yeah, you can pre-order the book and get a copy. I'll be shipping late August or September. So if you pre-order, you'll get your book first. Just for, uh, I don't know if you can say this, but, uh, the, the, and probably it's public even, um, which, which one is, uh, more successful, the, the fiat or the, the, the Bitcoin? Oh, the uh, Bitcoin one so far, the Bitcoin one so far, I'm impressed more, more than, more than double the fiat at this stage. Wow. Very cool. Very cool. Perfect. Then. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today, Alexander. And thank you also for everyone else, uh, watching and listening for joining us. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robin.